In this screencast, we are going to review normal female pelvic anatomy. At the end, you should be able to recognize and describe the normal appearance of the uterus, fallopian tubes, and ovaries. We'll start with the uterus. When assessing the uterus, whether it's on CT, ultrasound, or MRI, you should go through some basic questions. Is the uterus normal in size? Can I distinguish the endometrium and does it look thickened or irregular? Do I see masses or abnormal enlargements of the uterus? And does the cervix look normal? Are its margins well-defined? And do I see any cystic structures or masses associated with the cervix? When we think about the uterus, you can think about it having three basic layers. The inner endometrium on CT is often low in attenuation and resembles fluid. On MRI, it also resembles fluid and is T2 bright. The junctional zone is the middle layer. On CT, it is often indistinguishable from the myometrium unless there is an enhancement pattern that makes the junctional zone distinguishable from the myometrium, which does occur with relative frequency. The outer layer is the myometrium. It is the muscular portion of the organ. It is mildly T2 hyperintense to skeletal muscle on MRI and has a similar density to skeletal muscle on CT. The cervix can be thought of as an extension of the uterus and the three layers that we see in the uterus also extend into the cervix. In the cervix, we think about the endocervical tissue or the glandular tissue, the junctional zone of the cervix, and then the cervical myometrium. You can see a nice example of those three layers of the cervix in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. The endocervix, the junctional zone, and the cervical myometrium. One of the challenges with the uterus is the wide spectrum of normal enhancement. Commonly, we will see some degree of subendometrial enhancement or enhancement of the junctional zone that differentiates the junctional zone from the myometrium. But in other cases, you'll see diffuse enhancement of the uterus, such as described with type 2 enhancement here. Other times, you have minimal or no enhancement of the uterus. And we even can see a very patchy or heterogeneous enhancement pattern. It's not clear why these different enhancement patterns exist, but you need to familiarize yourself with the spectrum of normal so that when there is something abnormal, such as a mass or an infection, you can recognize the difference between the variance of normal and an abnormal pattern. Here are some different examples of normal uterine enhancement. On the left-hand side of the screen, you see little to no enhancement, and we also see calcifications related to flebolis within the uterine vessels. This is another example of minimal uterine enhancement, and again here we see very uniform, mild enhancement of the uterus. In this image here, we can start to see that subendometrial enhancement. We can see the endometrium here with the junctional zone enhancing, resulting in a nice three-layered appearance of the uterus. In this example, we see a more diffuse enhancement pattern of the uterus. And in this lower example, we see diffuse uterine enhancement that is more robust than the cervical enhancement, and that's a common way to delineate the cervix from the uterus. We don't often use CT in pregnancy, but when we do, it is important for you to be familiar with the normal appearance of the uterus during pregnancy. Early in pregnancy, the uterus will often be enhancing with a gestational sac in the center an early placentation or decidual formation evident. It is important not to mistake this for a uterine mass and realize that you don't see the fetal pole early on. As the pregnancy develops, we begin to see the placenta form and be a homogeneously enhancing mass 
that is in continuity with the uterus. We begin to see the fetal pole or the fetus as the skeleton ossifies. As the pregnancy continues, we will often continue to see a nice robustly enhancing placenta that's in close continuity with the uterine myometrium and we continue to see further ossification of the fetal skeleton and we can even begin to see some of the organs such as the liver or the skin. After delivery of a baby, whether it's cesarean section or a vaginal delivery, the uterus will often remain enlarged for many weeks postpartum. This is an example of a 10-week postpartum uterus after a cesarean section. Notice there is some fluid or endometrial tissue remaining within the uterus and a thin stripe is normal and gas can even be normal for a few weeks after pregnancy. Abnormalities would be residual soft tissue or high attenuation within the endometrial canal or gas that extends into the myometrium. If you do see gas in the endometrium, while that can be normal, it can also be a sign of endometritis and clinical correlation with infection and vaginal discharge is recommended. Now let's talk about the fallopian tube. The fallopian tubes are often difficult to distinguish from their adjacent structures. When evaluating the tube, you want to first say, are they visible? If they are visible, you want to try and decide why they're visible. Is there a twist? Is there edema? Is there hydrosalpinx? Are you mistaking an ovarian cyst for hydrosalpinx or vice versa? Are you thinking that what's truly hydrosalpinx is a, an ovarian cyst? And to help you understand where the fallopian tubes are, we'll use some basic references. First, you have the uterine cornua, and extending from the uterine cornua towards the adnexa, we have the broad ligament. And associated with the broad ligament is going to be the fallopian tube, collateral vessels that go between the ovarian artery and vein and the uterine artery and vein, and the ovarian ligament or utero-ovarian ligament. We also can see the round ligament extending from the adnexa anteriorly towards the inguinal ring. As we move a little bit more superiorly, we still see this area often referred to as the mesovarium or the vascular pedicle that contains the fallopian tube and the collateral vessels. And as we continue to move up, we begin to see a portion of the ovary and we also see the fimbria of the fallopian tube. On MRI, again, the fallopian tube itself is often barely perceptible. It's described as being one to four millimeters in thickness when normal and having T2 intermediate signal, which is why it's difficult to distinguish from adjacent structures. Sometimes an opposed phased image like I've provided on the right can create an India ink artifact separating the fallopian tube and mesovarium from the adjacent fat and help it be more readily apparent. When we talk about the vascular pedicle, again, it is made up of collateral vessels that are allowing for flow between the ovarian artery and vein and the uterine artery and vein, and that's why we describe the ovary as having a dual blood supply. The tube is closely associated with the mesovarium and the ovarian vessels, as is the ovarian ligament, which attaches the ovary to the uterus. And it is this structure that twists and becomes edematous in torsion. Now let's discuss the ovaries. When evaluating the ovary, I think one of the biggest challenges that trainees have is just finding the ovary and identifying the ovary uh, and distinguishing it from adjacent structures such as bowel or lymph nodes or vessels. I really like to use the ovarian vessels or the gonadal vessels as my guide to follow them down the retroperitoneum and uh, right up to the ovary. You can also use the round ligament to triangulate with the ovarian vessels to find that ovary. When, you're when you do find the ovary, you want to assess it for any enlargement, particularly asymmetric enlargement. 
you want to know if it's in the proper location along the lateral sidewall of the pelvis or if it's eccentrically positioned anterior, superior, or posterior to the uterus. You want to assess it for any simple cysts or complex masses. And you may want to be particularly aware of the presence of corpus luteal cysts or the corpus luteum and associated free fluid, a common condition we see in women with pelvic pain. Again, to triangulate the location of the ovary, I like to use the gonadal vessels. I have the gonadal vein here in the right highlighted with blue dotted lines and a white arrow. You can see that that gonadal vein comes down the retroperitoneum right to the ovary, which is circled with the yellow, the white dots. Notice that the ovary is also sitting right in between the external and internal iliac vein and artery just below its bifurcation. The image in the right has a white arrow on the uterine cornua and a white arrow on the round ligament extending anteriorly towards the inguinal ring. An ovary can be seen sitting just lateral and slightly superior to the cornua of the uterus. And you can see how in this patient you could triangulate the ovary using the round ligament and the gonadal vein. On MRI, the normal ovary is going to be in that same location, right? Pelvic sidewall near the iliac vessels, lateral and just superior to the uterine cornua. And the ovarian stroma itself tends to be iso-intense to skeletal muscle on T1 and T2-weighted imaging, although it commonly will contain follicles, and those follicles will be T2 bright and T1 dark and well-defined. In summary, the uterus is a challenging organ to evaluate because of its variable enhancement. Familiarize yourself with the variance of normal so you can recognize abnormalities. And remember that the uterus has three layers and that inner layer on CT is low attenuation and shouldn't be mistaken for fluid. The fallopian tubes are often hard to see. They tend to be indistinguishable from the mesovarian vessels and the adjacent ligaments. But remember that they are always going to extend from the uterine cornua to the ovary. When looking for the ovaries, use that ovarian vein and round ligament to triangulate their location and really make sure you evaluate their size and for the presence of any complex lesions.